You watching by television, why don't you stand up and say it with us? If you are ready for success, prosperity, and more money, stand up and say yes. yes. Give God in you a great big hand. All right, you that are here, don't sit down yet. You don't sit down at home either or in the bar drinking your suds or whatever because I have something important to tell you. I'm going to talk to you about how to prosper regardless of world conditions. I want you to know that you can prosper regardless of world conditions and that you can even prosper regardless of your conditions. Somebody may be saying, yes, but Reverend Ike, I am down and out. What can you do to help me? Now, I want to read something from the Bible to you because I said that you can prosper regardless of world conditions. Tell yourself that. I can prosper regardless of world conditions. You see, a lot of people don't know that. And you can prosper regardless of your conditions. Now, I know all of us have a favorite verse in the Bible, perhaps. This is my favorite number one verse in the Bible. Because it tells me how to prosper regardless of world conditions. And it is from Jeremiah, the 17th chapter the seventh and eighth verses. Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, the seventh and eighth verses. And I'm going to have you repeat it after me as I shall read it here. You watching by television, repeat it after me also. All right, repeat it after me now. Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, the seventh and eighth, verse, eighth verses. I want you to shout it back at me. Blessed is the man. And I'd like to transliterate that esoterically and say it this way. Blessed is the mind that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreads out her roots by the river. Now listen to this. And shall not see when heat comes. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Wow! Now tell yourself, I can prosper regardless of world conditions. Now that's the gospel. For a moment, turn around and preach that to each other and say you can prosper regardless of world conditions. Go ahead. It's good to know that. A lot of people are saying the reason why I have so much bad luck and I can't succeed is because of what's going on in the world. But notice what the Bible said. Blessed is the mind who trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. If you trust in the Lord and hope in the Lord, it doesn't matter what's going on out there in the world. And since this is a seminar about prosperity, I want to say right away, my prosperity does not depend upon the world. Let's hear it. My prosperity does not depend upon the world. 
Tell that to one another here. All right now, look on us. Look on us. And say, my success does not depend upon the world. Oh, now here's the big one. Here's the big one. My money does not depend upon the world. Wow. Now Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. In other words, I'm not depending upon the material world for my prosperity. I'm not depending upon the material world for my money. That's why this verse of Scripture is my favorite because it says regardless of the heat that comes, regardless of the drought that comes, regardless of the recessions and the depressions, I will still bear fruit if I trust in God. Someone asked the question one time, well, what's the difference between a depression and a recession? Somebody says, well, when you lose your job, it's a recession. But when I lose my job, it's a depression. <laughs> but if you trust in the Lord, you will always be provided for. All right, you may be seated. We're talking about success, prosperity, and money. Let me tell you how you go about it. I would like to say that success is a way of thought and action. Let's hear it. Say it again. Together, success is a way of thought and action. Now that's interesting, you see, because the Bible says what? As a man thinks, so is he. I put it this way also. Money is a way of thought and action. Let's say that together. Money is a way of thought and action. Uh-huh. You see, you've got to do something. You've got to think something. You've got to think the right thoughts and take the right action. You see, it can also be said, success is a way of thought and action. Repeat that again. And even money. Money is a way of thought and action. Say that. Now, there are many ways of defining success, prosperity, and money, and I'm going to be sharing these different definitions with you of the same thing from many different points of view. Money is something you think and do. Let's hear it. Now, I have a big sign here that I love to refer to when I'm writing letters to people who write to me for prayer and who have problems with money, success, and prosperity. And since you just got comfortable again, stand up and read it with me. Come on, it'll do you good. Repeat it after me. When you see those who have, and those who have not, you also see those who did and those who did not. You know, there are a lot of people who say, you know, it's a shame for some people to be so rich while others are so poor. But again, success is a way of thought and action. Say that. If you want to be successful, if you want to have money, if you want to be prosperous, if you want to be successful at anything, there is a certain way that you must think and a certain action that you must take. Reminds me of the story of the man who is always sitting down on the corner being nothing, doing nothing, and having nothing. 
So one day somebody said to him, Man, why don't you get up from there and do something for yourself? And be something and have something. Guess what he said? He said, I've been down so long till getting up never crossed my mind. Let me hear you shout. You gotta think something. And you gotta do something. Now I want to have you read this again with me again before you sit down. Because I want you to do something. I want you to take a certain course of action. Whatever your situation may be, however good, bad, or indifferent, you can do something about it. You can always do something about your situation. Preach that to one another for a moment. Go ahead. You can always do something about your situation. Always. Now look on us and let's read this again. Here we go. And I hope there's somebody watching right now. You're going to do something. I'm going to tell you some simple things that you can do. So let me hear you say, you can do something for yourself. Now here it is. When you see those who have and those who have not. And those who have not. You, also you also see those who did, those who did. And, those who did not. and those who did not. Now, are you going to be among those who did something about your condition? Are you going to do, are you going to do something? Are you going to think something? You know, if you want a different result, you have to think a different thought. You go right along thinking the same thoughts that you've been thinking. I can't. I don't have this. I got bad luck. I've got that. And I, I need this, that, and the other. And you never think a new thought. And you never take a new action. You are never going to get a new result. Now let me hear you tell one another here. You got to do something for yourself. You see, in Matthew, the 6th chapter and the 8th verse, Jesus tells us not to be like those people who be nothing, do nothing, and have nothing. Be you therefore not like unto them. Now, I'm going to say something, and I hope you will understand it. You've really got to pray now. Are you ready for it? There's a saying that I repeat sometimes, and you, you have to understand this. Come on up spiritually and understand this and repeat it after me. Watch the poor people. See what they do. And then don't do it. Now we're going to do the fourth step, forgetting what you want, the fourth step toward breaking through, breaking out into the good that you desire to be, to do, and to have. And the number four is feel it. I don't have this tape here either because it's, frankly, to tell you the truth, it's, it's, it's one of my Pentecostal type tapes. And some of you meta-magicians couldn't stand the excitement. But I'm going to put them on the market too. But the name of that series is Feeling Gets the Blessing. Write that down because, again, it's the technique. Let me give you one of my mind science beliefs. I started to say theory, but it's not, it's past that. I believe that on the level of the subconscious, when an idea reaches the subconscious and is impressed upon the subconscious, that it is impressed upon the subconscious as feeling. We meditate, we pray, we study, we concentrate, 
we praise, we sing, we carry on and jump up and down like we do here. But why do we do all of that? To impress a certain feeling. Notice the way I told you to say the last affirmation. I just love to see you looking so good and prosperous. You look like infinite money. You get the feeling in that? It's called spirit, a soul. There is a story that my series of tapes, which are not here, is based on in the Bible. The story of Esau and Jacob. The theologians tell us that Esau, or Jacob, the younger brother, stole the blessing of Jacob, his older brother. It was the custom in that particular culture for the oldest son to receive the father's blessing before or upon his death. He got everything, and it was up to him to be the patriarch of the family from that time on and to take care of the mother and the brothers and sisters and so on. And Isaac, the father of Jacob and Esau, was blind. Now, that is an esoteric symbol telling us that the Lord is blind. The law is blind. You ever see the blindfolded picture of Lady Justice? You see, that is telling you the same thing. What does it mean? It means that the law does not care who you are. The law of the Lord is no respecter of persons. If you work with the principle, the principle will work for you. Well, anyway, the younger son, Jacob, who was not traditionally entitled to the blessing, came to the blind father while his older brother was out hunting. And the older brother was hairy, but the younger brother was smooth. And the father told them apart by feeling the roughness of the hair and the smoothness of the younger man's son's skin. And the mother, when the older boy went hunting, said, favored the younger son and said to him, I have your brother's clothes in my house. Now the mother here is your subjective intuition. It tells you that within you, you have spiritual subjective intuition that knows how to clothe you in the correct feeling nature so that you can get what you want from the Father or the source. Because you've got to feel right to the Father. You've got to feel right to the source. You see, the Father is going to be feeling you as you approach Him to see if you're the one that's entitled to the blessing. But mother, your indwelling spiritual intuition says, I have your brother's clothes in my house and I'm going to put your brother's clothes on you and I'm going to put sheepskin around your neck and around your arms so that when the father feels you, you will feel to the Father like the one who is entitled to the blessing. You have got to feel to the Father, the infinite source within you, like the one who is entitled to the blessing. So the mother, a subjective intuition, dressed up the younger son and he entered into the blind father. And the blind father asked him a question that life is always asking us. He said to him, are you my very son Esau? But you see, this was Jacob. And Jacob said, I am. The theologians always call this a trick. They always call this a dirty trick. They don't get the esoteric interpretation at all. You know what that tells us? You are whoever you say you are.
with no respect whatsoever to facts. That is some heavy stuff. Are you my very son Esau? The question further infers, are you the one who is entitled to this blessing that you desire? Life is always asking you that. The Father, the source, the infinite source, the infinite resource, the infinite supply of all good is asking each one of you ladies and gentlemen, are you the one who is entitled to the good that you desire? Makes no difference what boy it is. You see, on a factual level, it was the wrong boy. But the father does not see whether it's the younger boy or the older boy or a black boy or a white boy or a brown boy or a red boy or a yellow boy. The father does two things. The father feels and the father hears the word, I am. What you add to I am, you become. Terry, on the other side, give me an I am over there and put a blank line. You can fill it in. You see, I am the beginning and the end. Say, what I add to I am, I become. Let me qu quickly finish treating briefly the story of Esau and Jacob. Now, when Jacob the younger son answered, I am, he was saying, I am the one who is entitled to the blessing. Then the father said to him, come close, my son, that I may feel you. Uh-oh. This tells us that in prayer, in meditation, in our treatment, as we say here, we treat what? For, for what reason? To make ourselves feel like the one who is entitled to the blessing. If you treat for, for good health or healing, you treat yourself so that you bring yourself to that subjective point where you feel like the one who is entitled to good health. Life asks you, are you rich? And you are to answer, I am rich. Maybe you're sleeping on the streets and don't even have a place to go to. But life is asking you, are you my very son? Are you entitled to a mansion in Beverly Hills? And that's when you better learn how to speak the word. I am. But then the father says, after you answer, come close, my son. Let me feel you. That's when you are glad that your mother, your subjective intuition has given you instructions and clothed you in the feeling nature of that one that you desire to be. Are you the one who is entitled to a lot of money? I am. Well, all right. My, in, my subjective intuition, my mother, has clothed me in the feeling of one who has a lot of money. <laughs> you got to get the money feeling. Let me hear you say that. You got to get the money feeling. Remember that song by the Righteous Brothers years ago? You lost that love and feeling and it's gone, gone, gone. You got to get back that love and feel. Bring back that love and feeling. Oh, that love and feeling. Bring back that love and feeling, cause it's gone. <laughs> Tell Dr. Frank they made me do it. But you've got to bring back that love. You've got to feel that you're that one. Your mother says, I have your brother's clothes. In other words, whatever subjective moods and feelings you need to feel like 
the one who is entitled and who has the good that he desires. I have that feeling nature that I'll dress you in. And when the father says, come close, my son, that I may feel you, you are to feel like the one who is entitled to the blessing. And the father feels you. And then the father also says something else. He says, come now and kiss me, my son. This also shows us that we need to approach the law of the Lord with affection and love. It's not telling us that one person stole another person's blessing. It's trying to show us, though, however, that even the wrong person can get the right blessing if they'll make themselves feel right. <laughs> that even a person who ain't got no money can get some money if he'll make himself feel like he's got some money. So go around looking like, acting like, thinking like, and feeling like you are who you want to be. And you are saying, yes, I am that I am. And you see, you come to that ultimate realization, and Dr. McCarthy is going to put this on the screen. The ultimate realization that brings money to you. Here it is. I am money. You see, I am is God. And whatever you add to I am, you become. Whatever you add to I am is added unto you. Did you get it? Yes. I'm going to have you repeat it after me. I am is God. I am is God. Whatever you add to I am, you become. Whatever you add to I am is added unto you. That's why we're told in the commandments, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The theologians have no idea what that means. Every time you add something negative to I am, you take the name of the Lord in vain. That this is why the mystic in the scriptures teaches us let the weak say, I am strong. If you don't understand that, you will think that you're being told to lie. But you see, it does not say, let the weak say, I am weak. Why? Because I am weak is not the truth, it is a lie. That's the lie. Another song on our Don't You Ever Sing That in here is that I am weak, but thou art strong. You have just cursed the dirtiest, lowest curse you have taken the name of the Lord in vain. And of course, the name of the Lord is the nature of the law. Now listen to the rest of the commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What does it mean? If you say, I am weak, the Lord of the law will give you weakness. That is the nature of the law. Let me hear you say, that is the nature of the law. That is the nature of the law. 
You see, we've got to come to understand God and the Lord as principle. Now, this is what the theologians don't want you all to get a hold of. You know, the Ten Commandments are not just a bunch of thou shalt nots because God wanted to stop you from having fun. <laughs> thou shalt not commit adultery. He wanted to stop you from catching AIDS. <laughs> well, now let me stop meddling and go back to teaching. There's a reason. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Every time you say, I am, you take the name of the Lord. Every mind takes the name of the Lord when it says, I am. Let me hear everybody say, I am. I am. Now you're taking the name of the Lord. You have taken it. Now, what are you going to do with it? Don't mess it up. I remember down south, we always said, and the, the, the older people always said to us, don't play with God. You see, people are unconscious of their power. Regardless of who you are, regardless of whether you know what you're doing or not, every mind takes the name of the Lord. Every mind takes the name of the Lord. Whenever you think consciously or subconsciously or unconsciously, I am, you take the name of the Lord. You are dealing with the nature of the law. You are dealing with the nature of divine principle. And you are going to get a reaction. According to the nature of what you add to I am. And you see, you come to that ultimate realization, and Dr. McCarthy is going to put this on the screen. The ultimate realization that brings money to you. Here it is. I am money. You see, I am is God. And whatever you add to I am, you become. Whatever you add to I am is added unto you. Did you get it? Yes. I'm going to have you repeat it after me. I am is God. I am is God. Whatever you add to I am, Whatever you, add to I am you, become. you become. Whatever you add to I am, you add to I am is, added unto you. is added unto you. That's why we're told in the commandments, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The theologians have no idea what that means. Every time you add something negative to I am, you take the name of the Lord in vain. That this is why the mystic in the scriptures teaches us let the weak say, I am strong. If 
if you don't understand that, you will think that you're being told to lie. But you see, it does not say, let the weak say, I am weak. Why? Because I am weak is not the truth, it is a lie. That's the lie. Another song on our Don't You Ever Sing That in here is that I am weak, but thou art strong. You have just cursed the dirtiest, lowest curse. You have taken the name of the Lord in vain. And of course, the name of the Lord is the nature of the law. Now listen to the rest of the commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What does it mean? If you say, I am weak, the Lord of the law will give you weakness. That is the nature of the law. Let me hear you say, that is the nature of the law. You see, we've got to come to understand God and the Lord as principle. Now, this is what the theologians don't want you all to get a hold of. You know, the Ten Commandments are not just a bunch of thou shalt nots because God wanted to stop you from having fun. <laughs> thou shalt not commit adultery. He wanted to stop you from catching AIDS. Well, now let me stop meddling and go back to teaching. There's a reason. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Every time you say, I am, you take the name of the Lord. Every mind takes the name of the Lord when it says, I am. Let me hear everybody say, I am. I am. Now you're taking the name of the Lord. You have taken it. Now, what are you going to do with it? Don't mess it up. I remember down south, we always said, and the, the, the older people always said to us, don't play with God. You see, people are unconscious of their power. regardless of who you are, regardless of whether you know what you're doing or not, every mind takes the name of the Lord. Every mind takes the name of the Lord. Whenever you think consciously or subconsciously or unconsciously, I am, you take the name of the Lord. You are dealing with the nature of the law. You are dealing with the nature of divine principle. And you are going to get a reaction. According to the nature of what you add to I am. You know, having problems with money does not always mean that you lack money. A, a lot of people who have a lot of material money have a lot of problems with it. And you know, that's the reason sometimes people will say, Oh, no, I don't think I want a lot of money because I've seen people with a lot of money have a lot of problems with it. Well, I'll tell you, I'd rather have the problems of having money than the problems of not having it. <laughs> You hear the old jingle, things go better with coke, things go better with money, even trouble. <laughs> even trouble goes better with money. <laughs> so don't knock money. You see, that's another thing. 
And uh, this is why you, ne you need to get the, the Master of Money course, because it tells you things to say about money and things that you're ne never to say about money. By the way, I'm going to give you this word. Here is a terrible word that a lot of people, almost everybody uses concerning money that you need to wash right out of your vocabulary. Are you ready for this one? Okay, put it on the board for me, Terry. Write it big. You're, you are never, ever again to say this about money. You can write it right under there, right, right on the side somewhere. Never again say spend money. Spend means it's gone. I've gotten rid of it. I'm not going to see it anymore. Is that what I've been saying? Yes. You, when you say spend every, every, as long as the thought is formed in your mind, spend money, you are dismissing money from you. You're saying, get out of here, money. <laughs> Don't ever think that way again. Now, let's have some confession and absolution here. Yes, we do have confession here, but we don't let you come into a booth and do it. You get your sins forgiven right out before everybody. How many of you used to use the term spend money? Let's see your hands. Don't do that anymore. Shake your head and look at the next person and say, don't do that anymore. Whenever Jesus healed someone, he would say, Now go and sin no more. No more. See, don't sin against money anymore. <laughs> now let's get into very briefly the semantics of circulating money. And I'm, I'm even go going to give you something to put in your checkbook, something to say whenever you use money, whenever you pay money, so that it'll come back to you. Now, that tells us what circulate means. To circulate means what? Return to point of origin. <laughs> say that with me. Circulate means return to point of origin. All of the money that I use returns to me multiplied in a never-ending cycle of increase and enjoyment, thank God. That's a part of what I say at the offering at my church in New York. Oh, by the way, I, I, you, you may use the term concerning money used, but I prefer circulate. You see, this way you've always got a hold of your money. It never gets away. It circulates. It goes over there and pays your light bill and comes back and brings more with it. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Come on, stand up. We're going to talk to money right now. See, that's another thing, you know. Think of money as a psychic entity. Talk to it. Reverend Knight says that money has ears. Not only that, did you know that money is a woman? Somewhere in Reverend Ike's book, there's that old Irish proverb. And money swore an oath that nobody who did not love her would ever have her. So money is sensitive. It's sensitive to what you think. It's sensitive to what you say. You say, oh my God, I'm spending my money. It says, bye, fool. <laughs> and you know what they say about a fool and his money? <laughs> uh, 
Ага. Окей. All right. We're going to find a way to apply this. Now listen. We are going to speak in other tongues about money. From this moment on, we're going to speak in other tongues about money. What are we never going to say again about money? Yes. Never. Ever. Okay, come on, let's make a declaration. Come on, you get your, your foot stomping here. Right here and right now. I cleanse my speech about money. I cleanse my speech about money. I'll never again say that old dirty word about spending money. I'll never again say that old dirty word about spending money. From this moment on, I will not spend my money. From this moment on, I will not spend my money. I circulate my money. I circulate my money. The money that I pay my bills with. The money that I pay my bills with. I circulate it. I circulate it. Whatever I do with money, I circulate it. Whatever I do with money, I circulate it. And it returns to me multiplied. And it returns to me multiplied. In a never-ending cycle. In a never-ending cycle. Of increase and enjoyment. Of increase and enjoyment. All right, give yourselves a hand for that. This is not going to change. Nothing is going to change until you change your mind. Mind is the formless space until you make it up. And the back represent the results of the way you use your mind. But as I say, everybody's on the back and they can't see the front. That's another meaning that God is, the face of God is formless and invisible. People can't see. <laughs> People can't see the cause. What is the cause? Thought. People can't see that, can they? Pepper every night, I'm teaching that mind science, that science of mind. I hear the Christian preachers, they're preaching it now all the time, and when they catch themselves, they deny it, you see. <laughs> Boy, they are good at it now. I listened to some of them, I said, are my ears here and right? So again, as I say, this is another application of God being invisible. People don't see what their thoughts are doing. But the stone that the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. You watch it. And what is the stone that the builders rejected? Thought! The power of thought! No, Reverend Ike, don't tell me anything about thought. I don't want to hear that. Don't tell me anything about that mind science. I don't want to hear that. Don't tell me I've got to change. She's got to change. They have got to change. The white folks have got to change. The black folks have got to change. The Jews have got to change. The Puerto Ricans have got to change. Don't tell me that I've got to change my mind. I reject that stone. My mother's got to change. My father's got to change. My brother's got to change. My sister's got to change. The church has got to change. You can forget that. The church ain't about to change. <laughs> These church folks have been the same way since Moses. The church folk caused Moses to miss the promised land. You see, that's why I don't get in any church fats. Honey, I come in that back door, and I go out that back door, and between the time I come in that back door and go out that back door, don't you never bring me no bad news. 
Well, don't bring me no bad news. You go around here waiting for people to change, waiting for the world to change. The world isn't going to change. That's why now the spiritual church, when I said church before, I meant the organizational church. But the spiritual church in the New Testament is the ecclesia, the called out ones. Those who have called their minds out of world thinking, out of world opinions, out of world beliefs. Those who stop dancing by the world's music. Those who stop dancing by the world's tunes of recession and depression, unemployment and the rest of all those ungodly things. And they are about the Father's business. And they know that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not die. That's the spiritual church. But the organizational church? Boy, look what they did to Moses. Look and see how they done my Lord? That's why... Maybe 13 years ago, and I told you flat-footed right to your face, I gave up trying to save folks. I'm out of the soul-saving business. I will teach you, as Peter said on the day of Pentecost, how to save yourself from this untoward generation. <laughs> and I want you to understand that that's what I come in here for. I come here to teach and to pray. If you want to learn, that's what I came here for. You want to raise hell, go to the bar and drink and raise your hell. And enjoy. But don't ever bring me no bad news. I'm not going to load my mind down to what, what this one's doing, what that one's doing, what the other one's doing. That's your business. I've got a full-time job trying to keep my business straight and my nose clean. I don't need your stuff. <laughs> Some of you not saved, I can tell by the way you're laughing. <laughs> But honestly, you, you have to be careful, again, you see, as you go through this world, that you don't get your mind full of stuff all the time. Because the world's always slinging it. They sling it out on the 11 o'clock news. They've got some 24-hour stations now where they stop the beautiful music every hour and sling stuff. That's why I tell you every once in a while, change your phone number. You get to talking to folks and they, they get to slinging stuff, tell them, play, don't sling that stuff through my telephone. Don't put that in my ears. Because as we studied in the disciplines of the mind, the first discipline that was called by Jesus, the mastermind, was what? The discipline of hearing. He's learned to stop getting your ears full of stuff. Uh-huh. Stuff in, stuff out. And all of this negative stuff becomes your adversary. Becomes enemies in your mind by wicked works. We'll have to restrict who gets this cassette. None but the pure in heart. <laughs> and people who've got good religion. Some people's religion can't stand strong gospel. I said, Reverend Ike, this is the gospel? Yes, honey, this is the gospel. <laughs> now, so all of your long-standing feuds and arguments and so on, get rid of them in a hurry. And from now on, whenever something comes up, get it settled on the spot. If 
you feel offended about something, settle it in your mind on the spot. What did I say? Whenever you feel offended about something, settle it on the spot. Now, quote after me again, Great peace have they, peace have they who, love law, who love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. When you love the law of God, the law of good, you understand the law of mind, you know better than to go around taking offense. Uh-uh. Because if you take offense, you're going to draw more offense. That goes into the rest of the meaning of this verse of Scripture. Agree quickly. The moment that a negative thought, emotion, or action appears, agree with God, agree with good, or it will cost you the utmost fathering. If you become offended or upset and you don't settle it on the spot, it will cost you your peace of mind and bring forth a chain of negative events. That is, the adversary will deliver you to the judge, the judge will deliver you to the officer, and you will be cast into prison. Your spirit will be bound. People end up in the hospital because of various psychic jokes and emotional jokes. What do you think's behind the high blood pressure? What do you think's behind heart trouble? What do you think behind cancer? Negative thoughts. Negative thoughts, moods, attitudes, and ideas. Those represent the back. You see, I am the first and the last. <laughs> but people don't see the first part. So the misery and the suffering of mankind represent the back part of thought. The things which follow the negative thoughts of man. So let's get to the front part. Let's get to the face. Let's get to the formless part. And let's form God. Let's form good. There again is a verse of scripture that says, Let Christ be formed in you. Say that with me. Let Christ be formed in you. Your self-awareness, your I amness is God, but it is formless. But in your formless self-awareness, you're to do what? Let Christ be formed in you. Hallelujah. Let love be formed in you. Let joy be formed in you. Let goodwill be formed in you. Let success and prosperity be formed in you.